Welcome back, everybody. We are so excited to be back with you for um, another episode of Outlander Buzz. Beth and I are together yes. this time, so yes. we're excited to be in the same room together. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, uh, and so we're, we have another episode focusing today on um, North Carolina history. That's right. So we are back with um, our special guest that Beth is going to introduce to you. Yes, and this special guest just told us that we were double trouble so <laughs> I don't know what that means but anyway um let me introduce you all and he was on our um on our video on our YouTube video um about four weeks ago something like that yeah. about a month ago um and he introduced us to the over mountain men and we're moving on to part two now where, which is the Battle of Kings Mountain that the Over Mountain men were um, involved with. But let me first introduce you to RG. He is a retired park ranger and park manager with 32 years of service from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He currently is executive director of the Yadkin River Greenway in Wilkes County. Trails and trail related projects have been a major aspect of RG's interest the last few years. RG has been a member of the Over Mountain Victory Trail Association, also known as OVTA, since 1983, and since then has emerged as one of the OVTA's leaders in promoting the trail and telling the story of the campaign to Kings Mountain. RG has been a part of our Outlander, North Carolina, Fraser's Ridge homecomings from early on and is also providing music, ghost storytelling, and other duties such as running my sound. Thank you, RG. <laughs> Both RG and his better half, Molly, are part of the Outlander, North Carolina community and enjoy absorbing themselves in the Outlander stories. Welcome tonight, RG. We're excited to have you back with us. Thank you so much, Beth and Carolyn. Looking forward to October 14th, as I know you guys are too. Uh, so we excited. are. We are so excited. And everything is looking so promising for this moving on forward. You know, I'm looking forward to the summer being maybe returning to somewhat of a bit, bit of normal. And about October, yeah. I think we're going to be there. Yes. I appreciate what y'all doing, connecting uh, people to their history. And yeah. uh, and that's such a big part of Outlander to me. Uh, and speaking of that, I brought my fiddle again today, and I'm going to play a tune that was probably around in the, uh, in the 1600s, 1700s in Scotland and Ireland. Called It's an air called Golan Castle. And it was a, a time in history when uh, the people of that part of the country were pursued many times. Their freedom was always in jeopardy, either taxed by the Normans or perhaps the tax by the English or the attacks by the Vikings, which were earlier in the, in the Middle Ages, on back to 800, 900 uh, AD, on up to the time of the, of the, uh, the Battle of Culloden in 1746. Uh, but the big part of the heritage of people that came from that part of the world was their Celtic heritage. In America, you think of that, see that word spelled out, and you think of the ball team, Boston Celtics. But it's the same yeah. word. And you notice the, the colors of the Boston Celtics, I believe, are green. And uh, we were uh, the throes of St. Patty's Day at our last presentation. And, but I thought I would play this old tune to sort of take us back and connect us with a little bit of that, that Scottish history, that Celtic history of, of the Over Mountain Man and a lot of their ancestral heritage. So this tune is called The Golden Castle. <laughs> Thank you. 
Very good. Fiddle up, be right back. Okay. That was great. That was, that was beautiful. I was gonna ask, RG, when was that written? Do you know? Uh, that was probably written in the early 1700s. Okay. Uh, so wow. it would have, been, would have been a song that would have been common uh, during the time of the Battle of Culloden. It's, mm -hmm. And it's called the Golden Castle. And it's not, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether it's Scottish or Irish, but it was probably played in, in both countries as it is today. Right. But it does have that ancient feel of the call for freedom, uh, sitting around the, the, and hearing the stories from the bards, the leaders in the community, and that the, the lament for freedom is what the, a tune like that brings to me. Right. Okay, so, we're, ready, we're ready to rock and roll with it with the podcast. All right, we're ready too. <laughs> I'm a rifle. <laughs> don't shoot us, don't shoot us, RG. We'll try not to be too much trouble, okay? <laughs> exactly. I don't want to do that because it might mess up my connection on the cell phone. <laughs> Well, R.G., as we mentioned last time, um, we know that the Battle of Kings Mountain will be included in Diana's next book. Um, on our last video, we discussed who the Overmountain men were and where they came from, plus what led up to the battle. We also introduced Patrick Ferguson on the British side and some of the important men who played a role on the Patriot side. So tonight, let's talk about the battle itself and the aftermath. So the first question we have was, what was the date of the battle and at what time did it actually begin? Okay, the date of the Battle of Kings Mountain was October 7th, 1780. Uh, the uh, battle commenced about three o'clock in the afternoon. There was one of Patrick Ferguson, Major Patrick Ferguson's uh, surgeons on top of the mountain that heard some of the first shots and he checked his pocket watch. They did have pocket watches in the 18th century. And he looked down and, and checked his watch, and it was right at three o'clock in the afternoon on October 7th. And what was interesting about that same time, uh, Lieutenant Anthony Allaire, who was one of the uh, British Tory loyalists under Ferguson, heard some yelling at the foot of the base of the mountain. The interesting thing about that, that's the same yelling that, that, the, over, that the British had heard the Loyalists had heard at the Battle of Musgrove's Mill earlier the summer of 1780 under Isaac Shelby. And he turned to Ferguson and he said, it's those damned yelling boys. <laughs> sort of still up, up, up in, the, in the British ranks because they, they pushed uh, the Loyalists that day at Musgrove's Mill under command of Elijah Clark and, uh, and Isaac Shelby pretty hard. Uh, in which was a loyalist defeat and Patriot, uh, a win that particular day at Musgrove's Mill. But the yelling component is very interesting, should be to Outlander fans, because uh, a, a common myth that's been out there, if the Overmountain men yelled in battle, they got it from the Cherokee or they got it from other Native American groups, Shawnee or uh, perhaps other groups that they had. But but in the battle techniques of the Native Americans, almost universally, they were into surprise. Attack you fast and then disappear off into the darkness into the woods. Take their attrition and leave so that they didn't have many people killed. So they were all about uh, using a bushwhacking or, or surprise and attack, what we would refer to today as guerrilla warfare. Now this is exactly, if you recall in the movie Patriot, the battle tactics that were employed by uh, by by the the patriots in the, in the in the swamps of South Carolina, in distracting and fooling the British, so they'd hit them hard and fast, take the attrition, and then they disappear into the darkness. And uh, there were several partisans who were good at that. One of those in South Carolina was a guy by the name of Thomas uh, Sumter. And another one was Francis Marion, who was also very good at that. Up in the upcountry of South Carolina, near what we call present day Pickens, South Carolina, named for, uh, named for the sake of Andrew Pickens, was also very good at guerrilla warfare. In North Carolina, old Benjamin Cleveland, all 350 pound plus of Ben Cleveland, mm -hmm. was really profoundly good at, at the guerrilla warfare. Over in Tennessee, 
another colonel there by the name of present day Tennessee, uh, John Severe, was also very good in the art of guerrilla warfare. The guerrilla warfare they did learn from earlier conflicts with the Native American uh, bands that they were uh, fighting with from time to time. And some of the, their experience in the guerrilla fighting went all the way back to the French and Indian War. So they were hardened with backcountry skills, the over mountain men were. Of course, this comes out in some of the episodes in the various seasons with, uh, with, with the Native Americans, of course, in Outland. And they do a really good job of bringing that out. The backcountry skills were such that even the, and we'll talk about this more in brief towards in presentation, but even the women in the frontier became good crack shots with their rifles and were able to help defend the homeland and the home uh, when the men were out hunting or at musters and that kind of thing. But 1780, October 1780, 1780, and the scene was the Overt Mountain men had surrounded the, the battlefield. Now, the way they found out where the British were there, I'll, I'll, I'll jump back to the battle in just a minute, but they didn't know exactly where Ferguson's whereabouts were on October 6th, 7th, as they approached uh, the day before. So they, uh, one of the men, one of the leaders, William Chronicle was familiar with a young boy who was estimated to be around 16 years old. His name was Enoch Gilmer. And Enoch Gilmer, apparently he presented him to be a spy because this young man uh, had super uh, above average acting skills. He could make you cry and laugh in the same sentence. He could make you think he was on the verge of lunacy. He could change in one minute and have a, a very formal British accent and make you think that he was very cultured and of the day of the 18th century graces. So they picked Enoch to go into the Tory uh, territory to see if they, he could find out the whereabouts of Ferguson. And Enoch, Enoch came up on a farmhouse, he knocked on the door and he said, I'm Enoch Gilmer. I want to join Ferguson's army. Can you tell me where he is? Oh, well, they with him, they invited him and, and fixed fixed him uh, fixed him a meal, and said, "Yes, Ferguson is over on that hill, uh, several miles distance over in South. As you get into South Carolina, called Kings Mountain, because we took him some eggs and chickens over there to his men the other day. And uh, so Ferguson was encamped on top of the mountain with about nine nine hundred to nine hundred and fifty, uh, some odd." Uh, maybe a little higher than that uh, because it varied, various accounts were up over, a, some over as low as 950, but somewhere in that ballpark of around a thousand men. And they were basically had their laundry out drying on October 7th because it, the previous night, October 6th, when the over mountain men approached Kings Mountain with the reconnaissance information gained by Enoch, young Enoch Gilmer, Knowing where he was, they they rode through a soaking rain. So it was so dark, it was hard for them to see. They almost had to hang on to the horse to tail, tail to nose, the way the horses went through the darkness. It was it was a tough scene. It was muddy, it was cold, it was windy, driving rain. And the old journals say that they trusted in God kept powder dry. Mm -hmm. And with their trusty powder horns and wrapping it up and so wrapping them up in their quilts they were able to keep their powder dry. Mm -hmm. So the sun came out the next day. The scene was Ferguson was on top of Kings Mountain. They had their laundry out, obviously drying out. So about three o'clock in the afternoon, the old over mountain men circled the mountain and the first skirmish shots were fired. Or Zuckel Johnson, the surgeon for Ferguson, noted it was three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. The Virginians and the Tennesseans were on one side of the mountain and Winston Cleveland forces were on another side of the mountain. William Chronicle out of, South, uh, out of the South Fork boys of the Catawba River were in one quadrant of the mountain. And, uh, and uh, other officers and their militias were scattered along in amidst this, uh, this particular scene. In other words, they complete, their battle strategy was to surround the mountain, fight Indian style behind trees and stumps making their way up the mountain and reloading as they went. It was basically every man is their own officer kind of a strategy. 
that there was not as much as a, a, a sequential fire as you would have seen in traditional continental line versus British, where you fire, they fire on command, raise their fire locks and they fire an order. And then when they get close enough, they fix the bayonet, bayonet bladed bayonet on the end of, the, of their muskets. And then they drive with a bayonet charge. And just to feel what it must be like on the other end of that bayonet charge, whether it's Kings Mountain, where it was the Battle of Culloden, when those trained British regulars were coming at you in formation, a tight formation, and they're holding their, their muskets up like this with a sharpened bayonet down, and they're driving towards you with shoulder to shoulder like that. It's not a pretty sight, pretty intimidating. And the British knew that they had uh, an effective way to win the day on most battlefields. Now consider that most battlefields. Kings, however, Kings Mountain was a different lake. Land of the land of was was laid out differently, and that it was a, it was a hill, and the over mountain men were attacking from several sides. Whereas in traditional warfare, many times the Continentals would attack in a, like a field, like a football field, analogous to football game. And they would attack that way and try to win flanking moves and so forth or bring the artillery in or the cavalry in on the flanks on the outside to gain an advantage. With Kings Mountain, there was no cavalry. There was no artillery. It was all small arms. Now, the over mountain men were on horses, but prior to the battle, the horses were tied behind the lines. And they had to pick out some men to hold the horses. You see, that's very important because if the horses get scattered, you have no escape route. And it's, the horse is your lifeline, uh, your safety valve if you need one. And understand what, what's happening there on the battlefield. Now, if you go to Kings Mountain National Military Park today, you can take the walk, walking tour. You've probably taken that before, Beth and Carolyn. Carolyn I imagine some of you guys have been there before. Some of our Outlander members have been there. And you can see different points of the advances they unfolded. But here's the sequential order of battle. The Virginians essentially attacked first and, and the Tennesseans, uh, the Virginians were under the command of the overall commander, William Campbell out of Virginia. William Campbell, William Campbell was a Scot himself, Scottish descent uh, along the lines of the Scotch Irish. He had a fiery temperament and he too uh, was, was quite a leader, quite a respected among his men. He was always a good to the lady folk who were in the militias, well respected among the ranks. And he was chosen to be the overall amongst the other leaders that were there because there was no generals in, amongst the Patriots of Kings Mountain, only a body of colonels, militias uh, under the command of their specific colonels. But he was given the overall command uh, because being, since he wasn't from North Carolina, it didn't create an unusual rivalry by having some of the North Carolinians trying to lead North Carolinians. So that's why William Campbell was thought to be chosen to be the leader. Uh, but the Virginians and Tennesseans were hit with the first bayonet charge, and it was a vicious one. The, the casualty rates were, were higher in that quadrant of the field. As the, uh, as the Virginians and Tennesseans scaled the mountain and they faced the first bayonet charge, they faced the second bayonet charge and they faced a third bayonet charge. But what happened with the bayonet charges, as the Loyalists came down the mountain, they didn't realize that they were being outflanked on the sides and then on the other over mountain forces on the flanks away from the bayonet charge were able to, to put them in a crossfire. And, and, kill, and all of, they took, started taking really high attrition during the bayonet charges. Furthermore, as they went up back, returned to the top of the mountain again, to redo the fight, many of the Tories were shot in the back. Mm -hmm. They were also shooting downhill, which in sometimes ballistics, especially the smooth bore guns, you tend to sh shoot a little high. So they were missing a lot of the targets, the over mountain men. Their bayonet charges, the over mountain men would scatter when they saw the bayonets coming and just disappear into the woods. Meanwhile, many of the Tories 
which were either in green jackets or red coats, or also dressed as civilians there too. In some cases, it was hard to tell the overmountain men from the Tories. Now, different types of hat gear. I've got a tricorn cap on, which would probably been worn by militia captains and colonels in the Patriot side. But then, very typically, what you would see is the flop hat, as it was called. And the over mountain men would many times wear this kind of a hat. To tell themselves from the Tories, who sometimes wore the green jackets or green hats, they put a flight piece of paper in their, in their band of their of their hat to tell set them apart because many of the loyalists were dressed just like they were civilian farm clothing and that many of the loyalists actually knew the patriots so yeah. in some ways this was a civil conflict this mm -hmm. was a personification of the hatfields and mccoys on a on a mountain in low country south carolina uh or up country south carolina i, I would say uh from the Piedmont and the foothills, and many of them actually were neighbors. And they even recognized some of the people fighting on the other side. It must have been a horrible thing to have to, have to, to feel that emotion and intensity. But that's almost like the, the old border walls wars in Scotland and England that took place back in uh, 15th, 16th, and 17th, and 18th centuries. The fighting that constantly went on. And some historians have even said, well, the Revolutionary War more specifically, the campaign to Kings Mountain was personification, a continuance of the old border wars that took place. Yeah. The Scotch and Irish uh, mm -hmm. fighting against the, uh, the British mm -hmm. uh, or the, the government, the higher command. And so you had a lot of that intense rivalry feeling. Uh, it was almost like the, civil, the first civil war could be thought of as the American Revolution because of that. Yeah. So. You had a lot of chaos taking place. You had three bayonet charges, which took uh, most of the casualties, the heavier part of the casualties. Meanwhile, Benjamin and Cleveland had uh, approached the mountain from another side and had to go through some swampy terrain to delay him getting to the battlefield. But when he got to the battlefield, what he found was the Tories were suddenly being pressed on top of the, a mountain and started to retreat down one side of the mountain. But that fighting also, too, was very vicious because then you had the proverbial animal in a cage where they knew that they were fighting uh, for death, for life and death. So they fought very bitterly, and that's some of the bit, most bitter hand-to-hand -hand combat on the side that Colonel Cleveland faced uh, the backside when they realized that the over-mountain men were gaining advantages and they were going to either be captured, wounded, or killed. And so that, that presented a different, uh, a different strategy, a set of emotions in the fighting that took place. And William Lenore, which Fort Defiance is, is, uh, was built in Caldwell County. In fact, they're gonna have a reenactment over there on May 8th of this year, but William Lenore was, had an account of the Battle of Kings Mountain that's recorded in the Lyman Drapers, Kings Mountain and his heroes. And he talks about his lock of hair being shot off and the mountain was seen volcanic where there, were, there was smoke and fire and men yelling, moaning right. back and forth. It was really quite a, uh, a chaotic event, the Battle of Kings Mountain was. There was a young man by the name of uh, Samuel Johnson, Lieutenant Samuel Johnson of, of, Wentz, of, uh, of Wilt Surrey men under Cleveland. He took a, he was actually a captain, but he took a, a break in rank to lieutenant just to go on the King's Mountain campaign. And that's how the how ardent these, these patriots were that they wanted to go fight and serve. He was hit seven, Lieutenant Samuel Johnson was hit seven times in the Battle of King's Mountain to survive the battle. Oh, At the good. close of the battle, somebody brought him a canteen water, held it up to his lips and sort of revived him. And he said, you know, I just might live if I could see we just found out that Patrick Ferguson had been shot. They carried him over to see the body of Ferguson, and he attributed that to maybe giving him the strength to, to carry on, but he survived the battle. Wow. And dedication here about back in October at his gravesite up in Trap Hill in Wills County, of which you, anybody can go visit today, Lieutenant Samuel Johnson, one of the heroes at King's Mountain. But Ferguson, at, at this particular point in the battle, 
was 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 knew that he was being pinched off. He was with his hundred best soldiers. They were known as provincials. Many of them were trained in up north, New Jersey, New York, Northern Virginia, and they were they were the best trained loyalists that he had. And there's been some debate as were they wearing red coats or were they wearing the green jackets? Well, it's most likely we might have been wearing some combination of both. Because at that particular time, a lot of the loyalist outfits consisted of, of the color green, the green jackets. Bannister Tarleton, who was the other colonel out there on the scene that was highly, uh, highly volatile and controversial in his treatment of, of the uh, Patriots, wore uh, green with his dragoons, his, his cavalry. And so it's thought that there was some in red coat outfits, there was some probably in, in the uh, what we call Tory green outfits. And then there was a whole bunch of the loyalists dressed just like the over mountain men, civilian clothing. So that kind of gives you an idea of what was happening there. But Ferguson, the battle had been raging on about probably most likely 45 minutes, it's been estimated. He saw a line, a gap, and and got a few of his provincials together and they decided to try to cut through and escape, essentially. About this time, a Tennessean, uh, a young Tennessean took his rifle and, and recognized Ferguson because some of the reports said that he would be in a checkered shirt, a red checkered shirt over his coat. And they saw him riding a white Arabian horse, beautiful steed. And he leveled his, his gun and it went click. It didn't, it didn't go off. He, he pulled it back. Nothing happened. And he turned to a, an older man, a Tennessean there by the name of Robert Young. Robert Young had a rifle. It was named Sweet Lips. That's the same. I've heard this story. <laughs> heard this story. Why Sweet Lips? And... Uh, he also called his rifle Sweet Lips. That's what, how much he thought of his rifle. He depended on it. So he raised up his rifle. And he said, let's see what old Sweet Lips will do. <laughs> Bang. And that particular instant, Ferguson fell from his horse, dragging, foot dragging the stirrup. And uh, there was about seven to eight rifle balls found, holes found in Ferguson when they got to the, the body. Because he was, he was shot and, and died there as soon as he fell off his horse. One of the men from Wilkes County, the, the history books say a man of color, was a man named Eusacius Bowman. He's one of those men that are thought to have shot uh, one of the shots that killed Ferguson. Mm -hmm. Interesting story. Uh, and there's other, other people that had similar stories like that at the close of battle. Just prior to Ferguson, uh, falling from his horse, he had broken his sword. And he had lost the use of his right hand at the Battle of Brandywine earlier in the war. I think we talked about that last time. Uh -huh. So he was actually using his teeth with the reins and mouth to guide the horse and his knees to sort of do like this, drive the horse and, and guide the horse. Uh -huh. And uh, in his left hand, he had his good arm and, and using the sword, but he was slashing through the forest and finally just broke his sword. At the close of the battle, uh, the over mountain men, uh, amid the chaos and so forth, started to hear calls for surrender. The over, many of the over mountain men did not know what surrender was and uh, or did not recognize white flags. So it took some while for them to retain order. Second in command was uh, Abraham de Peister. Abraham de Peister was able to uh, hold up the surrender flag and get the leaders finally to recognize surrender. Now, in terms of, of attrition, how many people were killed on Kings Mountain? There was uh, 28 of the over mountain forces who, were, who never did live to see the sun rise the next day, unfortunately, that died in the Battle of Kings Mountain. But the British lost uh, over 225 in the battle at least. And they lost uh, another large portion wounded, over 100, I think 150 some wounded. 
and around 700, over 700 were taken prisoner. Not a single man on the Tory side, the Loyalist side, got away that day at the Battle of Kings Mountain. Mm. It was a complete victory. It shattered one half of Ferguson's wing. He had a, a left wing, which consisted of uh, Colonel Bannister Tarleton. His right wing was consisted of Major Patrick Ferguson. And then he had his main army, who was stationed at the time at Charlotte, North Carolina. So he, he actually lost at the Battle of Kings Mountain nearly a third of his effective force. Mm -hmm. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty major hit. And so when news got back to Cornwallis, what happened a few days later is it took a little while for the information to get back to him. He quickly hightailed it to Winsboro in South Carolina and then eventually uh, made his way up into Virginia, what was referred to as the Race of the Dam, mm -hmm. where Nathaniel Green was on the hills of uh of Cornwallis and trying to beat each of them trying to get strategic advantages. But two months after the Battle of Kings Mountain, at the Battle of Calpians in January, January 16 and uh, 17, 1781, uh, Daniel Morgan, from which Morgan to North Carolina is named for today, the old wagon master, General Daniel Morgan, devised a a strategy which worked quite well. It's even used by West Point and modern, modern military today in that they, they developed an enveloping strategy in which they appeared to retreat and suck the British in under, under Bannister Carlton, essentially it, like bringing his forces into a paper bag. And then they surround them with flanking moves and were able to defeat him at the Battle of Calpians, also in South Carolina. Well, it's just uh, 30 miles up the road from Kings Mountain, Calpians is. In fact, it was the overnight uh, campsite before the Battle of Kings Mountain. The overman came through that same uh, area known as Hannah's Calpians the night before. It's been the night of October 6th there. Then in March of 1781, the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, in which Cornwallis won a battle, won the field technically, but he again took such a hit in his forces that his army was completely crippled. Somewhere between, it's estimated between a third and a fourth of his effective force was wiped out at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. So some victory that was. And the British said another such victory we cannot afford. Mm -hmm. But the events happened such that almost a year after Kings Mountain, the British retreated, Cornwallis retreated to Eastern Virginia to a place called Yorktown. Mm -hmm. And thereby he was trapped by the combined forces of General Washington and General, the French General Lafayette. Mm -hmm. Two years later, the Treaty of Paris made it official and we had won our freedom from the British crown. Thus, a nutshell, how important Kings Mountain was and the significance was talked about in Congress. In fact, Thomas Jefferson said that Kings Mountain was that turn of tide uh, the Kings Mountain was the battle that led to the turn of the tide of success for the gaining of America. That's how important it was. And uh, George Washington also cited that Kings Mountain was a very important uh, victory, and it set off the chain reaction, which in, it, in result was uh, the British were going to lose. But it did not look good prior to Kings Mountain. It looked like all hope was essentially lost. So that's where, that's how the battle sort of but we'll go ahead and continue on with additional questions. I just want to go ahead and go through the actual sequence of the battle and its significance. Well, it's kind of um, impressive to me what the Overmountain men did mm -hmm. and being able to, they really did, they, you know, taking out so many of um, Cornwallis's army there at Kings Mountain, which proceeded on, like you said, to Cowpens and then on to Guilford Courthouse later. And it was at that point, it seemed like Cornwallis was then on the run um, at that point. Is that, that pretty much the case, Sergeant? Yes, and people today come to me all the time, want me to find, help them find information on their ancestor that served at Battle of Kings Mountain. In fact, I had an ancestor that served with Virginians. His name was Francis Sturgill up in Grassy Creek in Ash County is where he was mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. There's and, Sturgill's uh, up here, yeah, I've seen it. <laughs> and 
And in, in the Battle of Kings Mountain, the old pension statement says that he he lost his uh, the use of his one of his hands, uh, what was referred to as a saber charge. I, I suspect it was the, one of the bayonet charges. So I had actually had an ancestor who who uh, paid price in part, at least, of uh, disability that he gained it, uh, from serving at, at Kings Mountain. Right. So, but folks are always interested in finding out uh, the resources. Now we do have this battle story available if you want to go and check it at ovta.org that folks listening in the pod, today's podcast can go check it out find out more ovta.org and then go to about and then there and you can find the history that i just went through and it'll tell you a few more of, of the personal accounts and so forth yes. so that's that, that uh so additional questions go ahead fire okay, away. i was going to ask you we know that the british had their bayonet, their right, their rifles, and their bayonets. What exactly? What kind of weapons was it that the Over Mountain men had at their at their disposal? Well, oh, I've got them right here. I, uh, of course, the Pennsylvania rifle was key to their success at the Battle of Kings Mountain. But to counter the bayonet in hand-to-hand co- combat fighting, they use the tomahawk and the throwing knife, somewhat in concert like this. Now the bayonet had the advantage of extension, but if over mountain men were penetrate that extension and get, get on the other side of the bayonet and fend it off, then he had the advantage with the throwing knife or mm-hmm. the hunting, or the throwing ax or the hunting knife. Now the throwing knife, and it's pretty to see, I know there was illustrations at Outlander, which I tried, it was pretty cool to to see if you could put it in the stump. Great demonstration, by the way, because it was hands-on, I loved it. But you wouldn't want to give up your tomahawk or your your throwing ax, because if you miss, I mean, there you are, it's in a tree somewhere, you know, and or laying on the ground, or worse yet, the enemy's hands. So, it was most likely used in the hand-to-hand combat. Yep. Yeah. But there was no artillery, no cavalry. It was all small arms or hand-to-hand. And the hand-to-hand combat did get very, fairly vicious, I understand, especially near the close of the battle, especially on that back side of the mountain when the over-mountain men were proverbial caged animal, knowing that this that was life or death. And now... They, you know, we see an outlander in at Culloden that the the they the Scots had their tar the targe right to protect you know to protect themselves, but the over mountain men did not have that right. That's correct. Uh, but the yelling yelling occurred in many battles all the way back to Bannockburn. I'm actually a descendant of uh, Robert the Bruce, which is an interesting just sideline. Oh, oh, very and, cool. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'm about, uh, it shows ancestry, my DNA shows about 75% Scottish. So I have a really a large dose in there. Yeah. But I do, I do come from, uh, from a lot of that ancestry that was in that neck of the woods, uh, including uh, Robert the Bruce. And, but then the yelling boys appeared in many battles from Bonnick Burn all the way up to Culloden, including the Battle of the Bowling, which is in the 1600s in Northern Ireland in which William of Orange defeated forces under James II, the Battle of the Boyne. And again, those yelling boys were later, uh, they were not referred to as, as Billy's boys or hillbillies. Mm. So that kind of, that, that came mm. when the hillbillies became the over mountain man, I guess. Well, that's <laughs> interesting. I mean, you know, I've never heard that take on the hillbilly phrase, but that's yeah. really cool. I mean, that's really interesting. Yeah. And the, their colors of uh, were orange, you know, the Syracuse University, the orange man and so forth. Yeah. Cool. And so ball teams, even to date, uh, uh, address uh, some of that Celtic heritage, like the Boston Celtics, the green. The green. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's kind of interesting. Tennessee Volunteers. Uh, what, yeah. What's yeah. Orange. I mean, you don't think about all these things, you know, that, that how they relate back to history. Yeah. Right. And even the Charlotte Hornets, right, RG? Uh, yeah. The Charlotte Hornets is has got its place in history too in the Revolutionary yep. War. Cornwallis referred to Charlotte because of 
of these banditos and ruffians of the frontier that that uh, succumbed to uh, guerrilla fighting tactic tactics. He referred to as it just being a, a darned hornet's nest. And <laughs> Have all team today out of it. Very good. That's a good catch. Now you yeah. ask about the questions there, uh, Mary Patton. Yes, a, a very important. Without her gunpowder, she made manufactured over five hundred pounds of gunpowder. Which mm -hmm. without that, there would no been no victory at Kings Mount. And she did this out in near Lisbeth in Tennessee, in the woods and hollows and the caves, going in there and collecting bat. Gonna guna or, or poop bat poop, you might say. Yeah, yeah. This necessary mixing with uh, sulfur and charcoal and other ingredients to make gunpowder. Wow. And so, what a tremendous uh, piece of history right there. Uh, some of our folk on the over mountain march today are descendants of Mary Patton, and they're very proud of that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, which which is pretty pretty in interesting there, but. Uh, what I like to do is to see people find that connection mm -hmm. between the, the Scottish history and the Celtic ancestry going over to the British Isles and get out wow. there and see that. Where, where can you do that better in any place I can think of right now are the events that we're doing at Outlander. So, yeah, that's a lot to be excited. And, and that's why, you know, when I got into Outlander, it was to begin with, it was more about the, the romance. But as I got further into it, especially with book four, when Jamie and Claire came to North Carolina and I started, I started realizing all the history I had that there, were, that there was here. Um, and it's really um, I make uh, Outlander is drawing people to discover mm -hmm. this history. Yeah. And that's really amazing. Yeah. And I guess we'll, we're getting close down on time, but I'd like to uh, share with folks the date. The route of the Overmountain Man is now a National Historic Trail, the Overmountain mm -hmm. Victory Trail. There's 330 miles of it, and you can find information on it at the OVTA.org website on how to drive around and visit the various historic sites. I recommend going to Lisbeth and seeing Fort Watauga, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you can go down to uh, Kings Mountain and the, and the Calpians Battle, National Battlefields, other sites up and down the trail mm -hmm. uh, and become acquainted with the Over Mountain Victory Trail and its history. Uh, it was a certainly a, a page turner in American history that we don't want to miss out on. And we're here to able today to actually get out and walk on a physical part of the trail and relive and retrace the footsteps of those who went before us. So that yeah. to me is a is an exciting thing. Oh yeah. Right. And did you say that um, there were only 28 pe uh, men from, from uh, the other mountain men that, that were killed? That's correct. Wow. That's really amazing. It is amazing. It it is. Their to be their own officer proved to be win the day, that particular day. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Cleveland and Shell were out there, and William Campbell too, urging their men on. My fellow Americans, you know, the day will be ours. Be your own officer. Fight hard. Never never quite run away, but reload, renew the fight, come back. They, they kept echoing those sentiments to, and right. spirit and kept men on. In right. spite of danger, uh, you know, think about reloading a rifle, but think about trying to reload that rifle when you're being shot at. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, it, I, I would it, be it, shaking. <laughs> Well, RG, let me ask you this question. Did they, um, I know that the, the rifles that over mountain men were using were not, it took a, like a minute or so to reload. So did they, did they retreat? Did they retreat? Did after they shot, made that shot, that one shot that they had, did they run back then to, like you said, the guerrilla warfare hiding behind the trees and whatever to reload. Is that, is right. that pretty much how yeah. it went? It, you would make a shot, then you'd find a tree, get behind it, and hope that no Tories came around in time, and you'd take you with a grease patch because your your barrel would foul up with gunpowder. You had to run a grease patch down to reclean it real quick. Time you put a ball in it, a charge in it, and drove it home, it, it's going to consume at least a minute. So that was a mighty tedious minute. 
right uh, or the next <sighs> shot and they also you need to make your shots counted too we're, we're just going to be wasting lead in shots but the over mountain man universally had a reputation for being good a good aims and good shot shooters mm -hmm. yeah. wow yeah 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 mm -hmm. well and let's uh, let let's let oh i'm sorry go ahead go ahead We'll, uh, and, and, and any closing uh, comments or questions to wrap up today, I see we're getting close on time. Well, we're good. We're good. And we can always continue this, RG, just remember. But I was <laughs> going to say, people can actually participate in this March every year. Is that correct? Yes. And go to our website. The details on the annual March to Kings Mountain, they start in mid-September and go all the way to October 7th. And always at 3 o'clock on October 7th, we uh -huh. have a committee ceremony at, at Kings Mountain Military Park, a beautiful program usually with right. interesting mm -hmm. speakers and so forth. And yeah. the over mountain man, we, the OVTA, usually gets the fire volley at Kings Mountain. Uh -oh. And we, we have celebrated the river crossings, events for the public to come out. And in normal years, it wasn't the case this year because of COVID, which we, we, we went to a virtual format and produced uh, quite a few videos that are out there. Those are also available from our website as well but but we generally have been reaching about 50,000 people in outreach wow. numbers wow last. that's great yeah a lot, a lot of school children's uh so a lot of school children we've uh basically fourth and eighth grade they study North Carolina history and uh in this state and so uh that's an excellent age to target to get them out yeah. yeah and they need to know this history you know that's the sad thing about me um, I, you know, I, uh, I learned this history much later than I should have. Yeah. And now that it just intrigues me um, to think about what what happened right here in, in North Carolina. Um, RG, before we let you go, um, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, we know about Mary Patton, but were there actually women camp, camp were there camp followers with the Overmountain men like you? like we've read about in other battles, were there yes. women that went along? Actually, uh, uh, Patrick Ferguson himself had two ladies. Both of them's names were Virginia. I guess it was appropriate. Virginia was initially doing the attacking on Ferguson. The state of Virginia. <laughs> uh, there was Virginia Sal and Virginia Paul. And uh, they were also uh, uh, understand buried with Ferguson in, yeah. in, 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 in the battlefield. He's buried today under a Scottish corn. And it's characteristically our customary when you go by there, put another stone on there so Ferguson can't get out today. Yeah, I've been, yeah I've been there and it's, it's, it's amazing that they have this, you know, and I threw a rock on there too because I was like, you just, <laughs> you just need to stay there. But um. It's really amazing because it's, I mean, people go by there and it's just traditional that, you know, you throw a stone on Patrick uh, Ferguson's uh, grave there. And, but but there's actually two women buried, you think there's two women buried with him, the two Virginias. That's what, that's what I understand. Okay. Uh, on, on the Patriot, I'm sorry. Work there, and they found ballistic information on where a lot of the heaviest fighting was because some underground penetrating radar they can find things like that today wow. mm. uh, and they've done some really interesting studies that are available from the park service there at kings mountain and it's just really a fascinating subject to get into and explore and then lastly and in, in our presentation today if folks want to contact us we'll be glad to guide them around and get them in touch with some information like that Oh yeah. oh yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, and I wanted to mention um, someone who is you know that is with the OVTA who does some beautiful paintings. Richard Luch, is that right? Is that yeah. how you pronounce his last name? Yeah. Richard Luch out of uh, Kentucky. He, the those bring the battle to the, his paintings are so beautiful, color mm -hmm. and and the, it just brings the whole battle to life. And um, I just want people paint. to look at, look him up on Facebook because it kind of yeah. gives you a visual of what it might have been like. How do you spell his last name? Luce, L-U-C-E. L-U-C-E, -E. okay. yeah. And his, uh, the painting of the depiction of the Battle of Kings Mountain is hanging at Kings Mountain National Military Park. So you can go uh, see it. It's a wonderful painting. It's beautiful. Yeah. And we make a lot of good friends up and down the trail and uh, 
we do what we do as volunteers, but we really enjoy it. So I'm look, also looking forward to Outlander yeah. 2021. Yeah, yeah, we are. Yes, we are too. Yay, <laughs> and we're, we're hoping that um, we'll be able to get Steve Ricker and some yeah. of the gang that um, does the program, like at the museums and that kind of thing, um, that they're going to be there with us to, and that's an amazing thing. That first person reenactment that they do is awesome. Oh, so yes. I'll, I'll, I'll really, find them and double remind them to be there. <laughs> yeah, I've already touched base with him a time or two. So, <laughs> but anything you can do there, That's right. Roger. It won't hurt. <laughs> you got it. You bet. Well, guys, I really, this has been really a treasure today. And uh, yeah. I enjoy talking about it, as you can tell. But it is exciting to uh, remember this history, kind of keep it alive and get yeah. people excited about, about it. It is. And RG, probably the next time we get with you, um, we want to talk about um the influence of Scottish music on the music of North Carolina so Excellent. yeah we'd, re we'd really love to talk to you about that right I can bring my hammer dulcimer and, and show yeah. some oh, things. yeah yeah, yeah. we'd love for you to do that <laughs> to game Appalachian music yeah I'd be glad to yeah okay that'd be great well thank RG you. thank you so much for being with us today we appreciate it we do thank that was wonderful yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care, RG. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.